morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Cannabis Business Live here at the Cannabis Legal Group. I'm Craig Aronoff, along with my colleague, Travis Copenhaver, and we're here to talk about everything to do with medical marijuana and the new Facility Licensing Act here in Michigan. We are pleased to say it's December. <laughs> All the work we've yeah. done. It's finally December of 2017. We've uh, come a long way, everybody, and we're really excited to get these applications online here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we have a lot to talk about today, so uh, what we first want to do is say um, like us, share us. We, we encourage the engagement. If you have any questions while you're watching the show today, please feel free to ask. Um, check out our website at the Cannabis Legal Group. There's a lot of great information on uh, the new Facility Licensing Act as well as our municipalities page. Um, if you're looking for compliant parcels and cities, um, that's a great resource to use and we encourage people to collaborate with us. We've gotten a lot of feedback from um, colleagues in the industry and, and, and certainly the general public. And it's a work of art. It's something that we've all collaborated on, um, both inside the firm as well as those that have helped us from the public. And we really appreciate that. Um, we also, uh, for those of you that are watching that are interested in joining the industry but don't think you're ready to get a license but want to look at working at a facility, um, cannabislegalgroup.com backslash cannabis jobs. Um, you can submit your resume, and uh, we have a number of clients that will be looking to fill the ranks of employees as we start to get their applications online. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, movement in that regard where people start to fill their ranks and, and get ready to get online and operating once the licenses are issued. So we encourage you to uh, participate with that and, uh, you know, again, um, share and ask questions throughout today's show. So um, a as you can see from the top of our page, it's uh, today we're going to talk about a winning license application. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but also some um, BMMR regulations, the Bummer Board. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with that, Travis. Sure. So we expect to receive the regulations sometime today. They announced that uh, they are being reviewed by their legal teams and uh, they expect to be issued at some point today. So keep watching uh, michigan.gov slash medical marijuana. Always spell with an H. The H. And uh, sometime today, I, we expect to see that enlisted on the website, and you can start reviewing the requirements that are going to be involved for any of these licenses you might be pursuing. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, at, at Tuesday's meeting, you know, Brisbo, Director Brisbo is, uh, you know, indicating that it's currently with legislative affairs in the law department so that the final language of these uh, emergency set of rules are going to, you know, going through that final approval to come out. Um, the indication, and when we read the first page of uh, the medical marijuana page of Michigan.gov, again with the H, and there's, there, if anyone asks, there is an FAQ on that on the site. So if you are curious as to why it's an H, there, there is a real answer to that. So go, go, look, go look that up. But it goes back to the old days of the Controlled Substances Act. But in any event, um, you know, the indication, of course, is, is we expect to see it by, quote, end of this week. That's today. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that comes true and we all can be working hard to get those, uh, those knowledgeable by the end of the weekend. Um, he also mentioned the application package. What, what do we know about that? Yeah, so uh, prior to the 15th, we're not sure exactly when, but they expect to release the, the application itself so people can begin reviewing it, uh, seeing the documentation they're going to need to start collecting uh, as it's going to appear in the application and start preparing those materials so people will actually have something ready to submit potentially even by the 15th, depending on your situation. Yeah, and I think importantly in that are going to be disclosures. There's, as we look at the checklist, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, but there's a number of different areas, um, in particularly, you know, through the, the financial area and through the, you know, entity information area that require disclaimer and disclosures. And so, um, again, at Tuesday's meeting, one of the things that Director Brisbow talked about was, you know, the state will be providing certain forms. So we've been looking at, do we create them ourselves? Do we assume what they should say? Or do we wait to see what the state actually provides and then maybe not chase a tail of something we didn't need to do? So um, we're very much expecting and looking forward to seeing that, um, that, uh, that additional documentation come out. It's one thing to give us a checklist, but we've had, we've had a lot of questions from people about what should the disclosure say? The disclosure should say what the state is telling us it's going to say. And exactly. so hopefully that's a form that once we get it online, um, and, and what we'll be doing with our clients, of course, is getting it into their hands and, and getting this you know, information um, put together. So we know the applications begin December 15th. A lot of questions have been asked of us. Do you really think it's going to happen? Do you think the state's going to be ready? And the answer is yes. Definitely. Clear and they, simple. If, if they weren't going to be ready, we would have known that well before now. 
So they, they're charging full speed ahead. They, they even have documents we're going to be able to start looking at prior to the 15th. So, you know, we expect on the 15th everything to be ready for submission. It's another, you know, matter whether or not you have those materials to submit anything. Um, but we'll certainly be able to hit the ground running when uh, the 15th happens. Yeah, and I, and I think another very important point about that, though, is, is that, um, and this is, I think you and I have both been hearing this comment from people, we're rushing to the 15th, it's mm -hmm. urgent, it's a, it's a deadline. It's not a deadline. It's the first day of a brand new era in Michigan. Exactly. That's it. It's the beginning. And quite frankly, it's not a rush to a finite timeline where anybody is going to lose out by being more complete the next day than trying to rush it in on the 15th. Right. Truth is, a complete application is going to carry a lot more weight than a rushed application that shouldn't, it will just be sitting there waiting to be finished. And so be patient and complete is the advice that sure. we give today on this. Um, another thing to keep in mind too is in, as we go over the checklist, um, you know, there's two parts to this. As we've said now a couple weeks in a row that, you know, the, 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 the application process is get vetted, get licensed. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, they, the state kind of conceptualizes it as two parts. The first part being your pre-qualification document checklist. Uh, effectively, what you're doing is you're hitting those criminal and financial background requirements that you find in the statute. Um, those are the things that you can really start completing, submitting, collecting, uh, while you're still potentially working on finding a location or going through any municipal approval process. Um, once you uh, obtain whatever local permission you're going to get from a municipality for your proposed facility, that's when you're going to follow up with you know, your license-specific application materials. So depending on which license type you're pursuing, depending on whether your you know, location and facility meet the requirements and standards for the type of you know, license you're pursuing. That's all conceptualized in the second half of the state's licensing process. And, and, and I guess just the, the mental picture that I always try to paint with clients is imagine you're sitting with an online virtual file drawer and step one is one file drawer, step two is a second file drawer. Mm -hmm. Once we log in and start registering the, the entity and the people, step one is turning from, you know, a non-existent thing to a yellow light. And then until all the documents from step one are actually in the drawer, it won't turn green. Sure. When it turns green, somebody from the state knows it's full and to open the drawer on the back end and start working on that particular part of the application. Step two is similarly situated where there'll be things we can put on there um, that we might have information on while we're waiting out, say, township approval through an, a prior approved, you know, submitted application. Um, we know a lot of people are actually waiting on the townships to even do their ordinances. In fact, I think it's fair to say 80% of the towns that have opted in don't even have an application process yet. So, you know, a lot of the part two of this application is really going to be things that we'll see really get more active, you know, in the first quarter of next year, I think, before than, than what we'll see before the end of the year, I think is a fair statement. Excellent. And so, um, you know, the checklist is on the website for, for Lara. Um, it is something that we can make available at any time as well to you know, our clients and those that ask us for it. But, you know, again, the pre-qualification, why don't we just touch on a couple of the items in there kind of by category yeah. so that people have a general idea of specifically what we're talking about. So, you know, the, the most obvious thing they're going to be collecting is a government-issued ID, you know, traditionally driver's license. Uh, you're going to need attestations for uh, different materials, uh, you know, on the financial end of things. Uh, you're going to need information about your entity. So if you're filing as an LLC, filing as an S Corp, C Corp, you know, partnership, etc. Um, you know, and that's going to depend on your entity type. You're going to need to submit articles of organization or potentially articles of incorporation, depending on your filing type. Um, things like your certificate of good standing, um, approval to conduct business if you're an outside company coming in. Um, if you have any trademark and insignia materials, you know, indications that you own and control those materials. Um, bylaws, governing documents, you know, resolutions, anything that involves your entity, you know, you're going to be collecting. You're going to need to show ownership interest. You're going to need to show your financial information. You know, we all are aware of these capitalization requirements. Well, this is the documentation that shows those assets or something this uh, applicant actually has. And, and that's where, you know, you're, they're going to be collecting things. When you look at um, you know, your bank records, your financial records, you're going to want to see tax returns for all the various owners or member managers, etc. Um, W-2s from your, you know, previous employment history. I expect they'll probably want 1099s and any other form of, you know, income verification. Um, you know, if you have 
tax liability outstanding, you're gonna wanna see what the status of that is. Um, you know, basically anything and everything that helps is establish to them um, what your criminal and criminal financial, you know, you know, asset liability, you know, status is both as the and corporate entity that's going to be the license holder and as the you know humans that make up that corporate status. And so in essence, what we're going to have is this process where we're going to be submitting a disclosure form that says here are all the items that you've requested in terms of answer Q&A. Um, and then separately, here's the documentation to support my responses. So it's, a, you know, it's a say your answer and then verify your answer process. And, um, you know, the more complete that those documents go in to that drawer, so to speak, the more likely it is that, um, you know, it'll get the attention and turn green and move, move quicker. Um, and remember, the goal of part one is to determine the eligibility. And so there's going to be individuals who are wondering, does a bankruptcy that I have maybe nine or ten years ago affect the outcome of my license application? Um, and truthfully, we don't yet know specifically how the board's going to react to certain sets of facts. we got to kind of let this play out a little bit. But the further things are in your history and the more you've recovered from them, be it a financial or a criminal matter mm -hmm. um, that's outside the buffer of, you know, if it's more than 10 years old, then, you know, you can explain what you've done since then and why you've actually learned from whatever it was that caused that prior problem. And, and maybe it had no reason to be concerned about it based upon how you've improved yourself and sure. everything, both financially and, you know, with, with your um, good moral character. Um, part two of the process is the part that is going to get into the specifics of your actual operation. So it's one thing to say I'm eligible to be licensed. It's another thing to actually show that you have a forethought and deserve a license from your application process. So it's where you're going to be, how you're going to run, um, site planning type of information, um, you know, what kind of employees do you, do you intend to have, what kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, the specifics of, say, the marketing plan and the inventory control systems. Mm -hmm. So in essence, the state is saying before we're going to give you a license and let you go figure out how to operate, we want you to go spend time to do due diligence and bring us the information you intend to use. Because year one, when we do these applications on these emergency set of rules that hopefully again will come out today, um, they're really asking, tell us how you're going to operate. Mm -hmm. Next year, when we go back to get you relicensed and go get that, you know, that license approved for the year two, they're going to say, show us what you did. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have this comparative marker to say, you said you were going to do one thing, you did another thing, it better be better than what you said you were going right. to do. <laughs> you know, we can't work backwards. And, and certainly the thing that we're going to be doing here at the Cannabis Legal Group, along with our um, affiliated partners at Vicente Cedarburg, which again, we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, our goal is, is to get our clients operating at a, at a regulatory level that doesn't say the emergency set of rules is all I have to do. Right. Really what we're going to be talking about is getting people operating at a level that says, I don't care where you put my facility, we can operate under that scrutiny and survive with no problem. Right. That kind of regulatory requirement. Right. And the state is not limiting the number of licenses, but they are you know, confirming anyone who's pursuing a license is going to be able to you know, comply with regulations, comply with the requirements of actually operating one of these facilities. So while you can look at this process as, you know, you have to meet a minimum set of, set of state standards, that doesn't mean those standards are going to be, you know, necessarily easy to be conformed to. And um, as Craig said, you know, they're, they're, they're still learning as well. And they're going to learn, you know, they, they are going to set emergency regulations and, um, you know, and we're going to operate compliant with them for that first year. But as they have a chance to operate this program for uh, a year or so, and they're drafting the, what will eventually be, you know, their more final version of that, they're going to see what things work. They're going to learn from the industry, you know, if regulations that they drafted in an emergency, you know, process were too burdensome or not burdensome enough, you know, they have the ability to, to shore up or change what those requirements are. You know, they might be a minimum standard now, but they might not be the same minimum standard when you have to go reapply and they'll be reapplying every year. So even if you're capable of meeting whatever standards they, you know, issue now, you want to make sure you're capable of having your operation meet you know, a set of standards that you should be operating by, not necessarily one defined by the state, um, but one that you know the state will want you to be operating it to be a responsible license holder. 
Um, and just real quick, there's a couple of license uh, questions that we can take real fast that I think will dovetail into the next part as we go over you know, the state's FAQs. Um, first, Marvin, you'd asked, you know, is the state's not limited the amount of licenses they'll issue, and that's correct. Um, the only limit on the number of licenses we'll have in the state of Michigan is if we add up all 1,700 municipalities and any of them that approve and say how many did they all approve, and then we aggregate those all those numbers, that's the limit. And so, you know, one community might say, well, we're only going to allow 10 licensees, so that's the limit for that community. Another community might say, we don't have a limited number, but we do say you have to be 500 feet apart. So mathematically, by buffer, there might be 50 in that community. Um, and then we look at and keep looking at every community, and we add all those up. So from the state's perspective, every single license that each community is authorized to say is approved, that's the total. Mm -hmm. um, and that is going to continue to go up after year one because right now there's only, what, 50 to 60 opted in out of 1,700. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, even getting municipalities online in year two for that part two of this application. Um, Aaron, you had asked a question that can you apply at the initial time or can it, you apply any time and will that hinder any chances? And that goes back to rushing to December 15th. Let me mm -hmm. answer that real yeah, quick. Yeah, there. I mean, at the state level, there is no difference between applying immediately on the 15th and applying three months after that. I mean, if you might be put in a queue based on you know the board's ability to process each license. So if you don't want, you know, the sooner you get it in, I assume the sooner they'll be able to review your portion of those materials. But beyond that, you know, there's no decision that they have to make. There's no limit that they're issuing. You take each applicant individually and you determine whether or not they, they meet the standards required by the state of Michigan. If one location does and one location doesn't, uh, that's not a time factor. That's a quality of that applicant factor. Yeah, and, and in reality, I mean, it, it, it's, and that's a great point, it's going to be the quality, but it's also the completeness of that packet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you are sitting on, an, on a financial disclosure form that isn't uploaded, your packet is sitting there yellow it's not getting anywhere so again you might start and put in say five of the seven items that you need and then get the other two ready and so there's that that added time until it's green the state is just waiting for you mm -hmm. nobody's rushing it nobody's closing the opportunity and again it's day one of a new era right. and by no means is it a limited era this is going to be wide open for some time um, and, and just so a, a lot of people are, even at the last Lauer meeting, there were a lot of questions that Chairman Johnson actually answered. Go check out the FAQs, mm -hmm. um, the, the you know frequently asked questions that are on the, the Lara website. Y you know what? They've done a lot of work. Yeah. No, we, were, <laughs> we were looking at that after they issued it, and um, yeah. they've really broken it down in a really convenient you know process. They, they, they are taking those questions that get raised seriously. Um, and there's a laundry list of, of really good questions and answers they've provided or you know, to the extent they're able to provide at that time. And uh, I encourage you again to go to the Michigan.gov slash medical marijuana, take a look at those. And if you have a question you'd like the board to answer and you're not seeing it on the current FAQ, we have a really convenient you know, submission form where you can you know, put your name, email, and, and ask a question of them right on that same website. Yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, in, I, I think we often talk about getting informed, learning more, get your PhD in this industry, and I wrote a blog about that recently. <laughs> I, you know what, the, the fact of the matter is, learning these FAQs, knowing where to go for information. If you're sitting back waiting for people to feed it to you, you're not doing enough to make sure you're going to be successful in this industry. You've got to go and firmly grab the information, engage the industry, have the conversation, and do things like attend our seminar, mm -hmm. which is coming next week on December 8th. And so um, we have a really, really great seminar. If you go to CannabisLegalGroup.com, you'll see the uh, seminar information directly, and you can buy a ticket through that. But um, this is going to be uh, a really, really different and fantastic substantive um, process. And so our new seminar, we're going to have our partners from Vincente Cedarburg. We talked about that a little bit, but, um, you know, what we've done is we've now affiliated with uh, the largest or one of the largest marijuana firms out of the state of Colorado. They have 14 years of cannabis experience and working in other markets, including uh, having licensed clients in 18 states. So, you know, because we haven't actually been able to do licensing in Michigan, we ourselves had to go to other places and begin to touch files and applications. And our paralegals 
actually were in Denver filing an Ohio application, two of them actually on behalf of other clients. And so, you know, it's really great that we have this bandwidth now and the support of, you know, operating entities and procedures and whatnot that really go beyond the state line. And, and that's exactly. part of our PhD in, in, as a firm in maturing ourselves for purposes of servicing our clients locally. Um, but at our seminar, and why don't you tell us a little bit about how it breaks out, sure. what you'll see is, you know, they're here with us mm -hmm. and they'll be there. So we have a full day of uh, different topics, you know, starting in the morning, we're going to be talking about you know, how to find licensing in, in good properties. We're going to be talking about the economics of the market. Uh, we're going to talk about business planning. Uh, we're going to talk about accounting and tax issues. Uh, we're going to talk about regulations, uh, updates that might happen with uh, what's going to happen with the uh, ballot initiative to get adult youth on the ballot. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the political system, how to not only write an application, but how to write a successful application. Um, I think I'm going to be talking about brand you know decisions how what parts of your brand can be protected what can't and and the tools you can use to you know establish brand protection and develop yourself yeah i mean and so you know in the way it's broken out is is the two of us along with barton here at the cannabis legal group will each be you know taking on a topic um we have uh andrew livingston dwight clark and brian vincente from vincente cedarburg coming in from colorado they're each going to carry mm -hmm. a segment as well we have our CPA, uh, Simon Guma, who will be talking about those tax and 280E complications. Um, and, you know, we also have Robin Snyder from the Coalition to Regulate Alcohol or Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol. And so, again, we're touching it on so many levels. And, and it's, it, the tickets are coming off the shelf. We're getting yeah. a great response. We actually even have some great sponsors. Um, Green Industry Services, which is, you know, a team that will help build your vision. Um, brick and mortar cannabis. Insurance. You must have insurance. This is an agency that can provide cannabis-related coverage as well as some real estate services. Um, WJ Cousins and Associates. Security planning. Again, it's a requirement. You have to have security planning. Senatrol, security equipment. If you're going to plan it, you might as well buy equipment. Mm -hmm. um, we have Ecojiva, solar systems. You know, the difference maker for a lot of these operations is an energy consumption and cost. You can lower your cost. You can maintain profitability even as the supply cost goes, you know, increases and wholesale cost goes down. Um, Existo services, software interaction with the seed to sale system. And then finally, Grow Commander, a UV light technology that will help get rid of, you know, pathogens that might be growing in your in your um, facility and, and, and save a crop and so great group of uh, sponsors great group of you know speakers in terms of the topics and everything is geared towards we're gonna get you licensed December 15th here's the tools here's right. what you need and not only are we gonna have great presentations great sponsors but this is really an opportunity to not only ask questions directly of us and several attorneys that are directly experienced in this but it's a great networking event as well I mean you might be pursuing one type of license, but no matter what license you're pursuing, you're going to be interacting with all five of the license types. Or even if you might not be in a position to pursue a license right now, you might be able to connect with someone who needs your skill set, or you might need some skill to bring into your proposed you know, process. So coming to meet people who are interested, you know, being in the room with these same people is an opportunity to make those connections and, and put your best foot forward when you eventually part, start pursuing your application. Yeah, no, no question about it. You know, networking is key. You know, just because you grew it didn't mean anyone bought it. Just because you mm -hmm. processed it didn't mean anyone knew about you. And just because you have a provisioning center doesn't mean you have any supply to put on your shelves. You know, we have to contemplate how the uh, vertical will actually work up and down the market stream. And so networking our clients, networking our seminar attendees, and of course networking through things like the small Michigan Small Cannabis Business Association are very, very key right now. This is the time to make introduction, to get to know people. You know, at, at the end of the day, this is all about a people interaction. You know, there are businesses, but you got to trust the people that you're doing business with. Mm -hmm. um, so get to know them, attend these events, show them that you're interested in learning more and being that operator that can actually say at the end of the day, I don't care where I'm operating, I know I'm good to operate and be compliant, be successful and continue to be licensed year after year and earn that privilege for that license. It's not a right. Just because you spent the money and think you got an approval doesn't mean you can go on forever. You got to show them that you can do this correctly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, getting that continuing education, so to speak. So, 
you know, um, we're really excited. We got a, a, a very, very busy schedule for ourselves, for our clients, for everything that's coming up over the next week and two weeks before this licensing. Pay attention, follow and ask questions, check out those FAQs. And I think it's fair to say that when those emergency set of rules come out, you may see Travis and I circle back and have another conversation with you. If not, you know, over the weekend, they're probably early next week. So yeah, we can discuss hoping, that. We're hoping to um, have some good homework over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we'll definitely take on a Facebook Live that will focus on those emergency set of rules. As soon as we know it, we'll schedule it. And then we'll look forward to seeing you all then. So for Craig Aronoff and Travis Copenhaver, thank you very much for watching and asking those questions. Feel free to ask more online and offline. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week on uh, probably from our seminar or prior to with these emergency set. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that button.